Participles are probably the most useful part of the Greek verb you're going to learn. Therefore, it's really important you get to grips with them. You're going to meet some of the basic forms now and build up the picture of these as we go through more about Greek. Again, they're a mood. So building on chapter 18, you've now met the indicative, subjunctive, imperative, infinitive and participle. The ones you've met so far. Luor, the indicative, luor, the subjunctive, the imperative, lua, and the infinitive, luain. I'm just putting an example of each in. The participle is going to be luon in its headline form. If we gloss these, I untie, I untie, but something else is going on. Untie, to untie, and untying. So, headline is that participles are your ing ones in the present. Building on that a little bit, I've added in some material from the Duff references because there's quite a lot on participles in there that's relatively useful for you. But in summary, they are verbal adjectives, which means they take their root meaning from a verb and then their endings from an adjective because they describe nouns, therefore we need to agree with them. What that means is that they've got tense and voice and number, but not person. And they've got case, gender and number. Obviously, those two have crossed over. So there could be a lot of different morphological markers going on in participles, but they are extremely useful. Dobson's angle so far is just to give you the basic present form, lagon. Here you've got the article, the, speaking. But what that's shorthand for is the man speaking, because you know that this is nominative masculine singular. So... He's immediately said, OK, this is how you form them. They've got own on the end. We'll look at the form in a moment. One of the major uses of participles, chuck it with an article and you get another kind of agent noun. So article plus participle is some kind of agent. You get the person who is doing that verb. Stop and pause to think about vocab in this chapter. Anna, man, guna, woman. Huyos, son, parte, father, mete, mother, fauna, voice, didomi, I give, and proskuneo, I worship. These are useful words, but they're also words that do not behave in a regular fashion, all of them. So they are ones that you need to pay a little bit of attention to. Things to note. Anna, Guna, Pater, Mete are all third declension. We're going to look, pause over that in a moment, but you haven't really covered it yet. And it is one of the slight omissions in this book is it doesn't go through it particularly systematically. But that means in order to make any use of them, you also need to know the genitive because there's going to be a change in the stem. So the genitive of man is Andros. The genitive of woman is Gunaikos. Genitive of father is patros, of mother, metros. So you'll see that os is now a different ending to what you're used to seeing in the genitive. They've all changed their stem. Gune, gunaikos, now you can see things like gynecology. Ane, andros, now things like androcentic make more sense. It's often the genitive stem that underlies a lot of the derivations. So sometimes the derivations will help you remember the way that third declension nouns work. Huyos is a perfectly straightforward second declension word. Fauna is a perfectly straightforward first declension word. Didomi is a beast of a word. There is a class of verb called me verbs. They have very slightly different endings. You will be introduced to them later on. Basically, anything that's got do or do in the stem, and probably not much else, is going to have something to do with giving. So as long as you can recognise that do or do, 
likely to be something to do with giving, you'll probably work out what part of the domain you've got. Pros cuneo, it's worth noting that this takes the dative. There is a word that we sometimes see written in English, proscuneosis. That's the cis noun from proscuneo, i.e. the feminine process noun that comes from the verb, the action of proscuneosis. And this is what Persians would do to their king, bow down, prostrate themselves before them. So it's a physical form of worship. It's what the Greeks wouldn't do towards Alexander the Great that caused some of the revolts because Macedonians wouldn't do that to their leader in a way that Persians would. So when Alexander the Great demanded it of his men, they, they said no, because he was acting too much like a Persian despot. It's used in the New Testament with the dative just to mean worship in a Christian sense, but its roots are very physical. And one of the things you might want to think about is the relationship between Greek and both the Jewish tradition and the Greek tradition of worship, and where physicality and spirituality interact, and how we can express ourselves in a Christian sense when our language is drawing, for example, on physical forms of worship rather than an internal life. That may be a slight overreading, but it's one of those things that you can start to think about when you're learning more about Greek and the relationship between the language and the culture that it might represent. You do need to think about the third clension. Tis tenatonos teni tenes tenatonos the, the standard thing is to learn down the column. You don't have to, but that's that's a general way people learn this one. The important thing to note is that the nominative is useless. It is not a pattern that will help you with the rest of the word, unless you know that it's part of a group of words. Because once you get to the genitive, the stem changes. And that changed stem will then influence the rest of the word. So whenever you learn a third declension word, you absolutely have to learn the genitive too. You get the basic form of tis on page 88. He introduced it accented, tis with an accent, meaning who or what in the neuter. This is tis without an accent, meaning a or some. It's the indefinite pronoun. It's a very useful word. Once you've got to grips with the fact there is a separate pattern of endings that will then account for the other half of all your nouns, participles, adjectives. So hoheto accounts for half of them, tis accounts for the other half. You'll notice there are still some patterns. All genitives end in omega nu. Masculine and feminine are the same. You cannot differentiate between gender in the third declension. If you want to, you have to use something else. Neuter, nominative and accusative are still the same. And in the plural, they still both end in alpha. And after the nominative accusative, it agrees with the masculine, and in this case, the feminine, all the way through. Tissy is a bit weird. What you've got here is tintsy. But ns is not a normal Greek combination of sounds. So the new drops out. And you end up with tissy. And an optional new on the end. Tissin, tissy. Both of those are acceptable. That's your basic third declension paradigm. You're going to need that to make sense of participles. The participle Dobson chooses to give you is the participle for the verb to be. And this is, in many ways, an ending in search of a verb. These are your participle endings with no verb attached to them. So own, us, on. You had leg, own. Here you just got own. So own is being. That would be your onsi, like your tissy, reduced down, losing the new in the process. So the masculine and the neuter follow the pattern of the third declension that you just saw. The feminine does not. The feminine is a bit different. Because there is no different feminine form in the third declension, if you want to designate something as feminine, you have to look elsewhere. And the obvious place to look is the third declension. So these are all what are called 313 paradigms, which means the masculine and the neuter come from the third declension, but the feminine borrows for the first declension. The feminine is therefore that regular pattern you've seen, like, for example, phalassa or doxa, where it's going to maintain the sigma all the way through and have alphas and etas in its endings. You've still got omega nu in the genitive plural, but this time it's uson rather than onton. It's got a different stem. 
So participles need to be learnt carefully because they are part of the pattern of adjectives that mix third and first declension. These aren't new endings once you've learnt the first and third declensions, they're new applications of them, so they shouldn't be too difficult for you to have to deal with. That's what Dobson gives you so far in lesson 19. We'll look at how it's applied as we continue to move through the course.